Well, tonight is, a, is our second night of um, uh, digging deep, and every summer I told Dr. John Mead that we have a digging deep uh, seminar for the summer. It starts out f full, and then we have maybe two left. <laughs> yeah, uh, that's right. I feel like Jesus. <laughs> By the end of the summer, I know exactly how he felt in the Garden of Gethsemane as they all left him. But I've learned. I've learned a trick is to bring in interesting speakers, uh, and, and that will change things. But let me just tell you about Dr. John Mead. <clears throat> he joined the Phoenix Seminary faculty in 2012, so he's been there in Phoenix, Arizona, and he teaches courses in Hebrew language, Old Testament literature, Greek language and literature, biblical theology, and he has research interests in uh, a lot of things regarding uh, with, with um, uh, the early church, the Septuagint, uh, textual criticism. I, I focus on the New Testament. He focuses on the Old Testament, but I know he knows about the New Testament as well. The canon of Scripture, that's why he's here tonight, and biblical theology. I told him, I said, are you the only, fa only faculty at Phoenix <laughs> Seminary? It seems like you're teaching everything. He said, no, there are other people there too. But he is a visiting scholar at Southeastern Seminary in Wake Forest. So what sometimes uh, institutions of higher learning do is they, they kind of uh, swap scholars and they get a chance to go somewhere, research and teach and make a contribution in another university and you build collaboration that way and you, right. you, you build friendships yes. for life and you, yes. you do big projects that way. Yes, that's good. And so um, I had the opportunity to meet him I would say about two months ago, mm -hmm. and we were at a, at a colloquium uh, listening to a famous scholar, and he was around the same table, and something told me to go talk to him, and I did, and I'm glad I did. I learned about who he is and what he's been doing, so I went to the trusted resource called Google. <laughs> I was like, let me find this guy. Is he for real? <laughs> of course he was for real. And then um, a few weeks later, uh, he was doing a talk on Canon at the library in southeastern Wake Forest, and I had a chance to hear him again. And, and so that's how it happened that he's here. But he's also, uh, his wife and four children, three girls, one boy, they're in Wake Forest, uh, and they're also here, but they'll be going back in about a week. And so um, we'll definitely uh, miss them being so close to us. But I'm really excited because He's going to be talking about the canon. Now, you saw me hold up this book last week. Uh, it's Biblical Canon List from Early Christianity. And um, Dr. Ed Gallagher and Dr. John Mead uh, wrote this book. But the one thing that I mentioned to you last time is it was published by Oxford University Press, which is a, a big thing. And, and I clarified it's not Oxford, North Carolina. Uh, this is the one in, one in London. So, uh, anyways, Dr. John Mead, it's good to have you here tonight. Would you come on up and share with us? Thank you, brother. Yes, sir. <laughs> oh, it is great to be with you all this evening. Uh, to talk about something that I think is uh, quite neglected uh, in the church today. This is the big question. Why does our Bible have the books it does? So, very, very quickly and carefully, notice I'm going to defend what's in this Bible here tonight, okay? I'm not here to describe how the Ethiopian church has its Bible, okay? or the Armenian church has its Bible, uh, or the Coptic church, or the Syriac church. They're, those are other bigger questions. What I, what I want to just explain tonight, as simply as possible, is why we have our 66 books in our, what we might call, Protestant canon, or Protestant Bible. Let's go to the next slide. Maybe I'll just do this, John, if you, okay. So let's be clear, we're talking about the item on the, on the left, not, not the one on the right, the item on the right really hurts people. The item on the left heals people, okay? So let's be clear about which canon we're talking about. Uh, it's the one with one N, the one on the left. What does canon mean? 
Well, the quick and messy etymology, that is the history of the term canon, is this. It comes from a Greek word, kanon, from where the Latin canon comes from and where we get our word canon. This word initially meant a reed or a plant that grew up along the side of the Nile River in Egypt, for example. From there, the word came to mean a measuring stick or a rod, right? If you have a straight reed, then you could have a, a measuring stick or a rod. This simple measuring rod then took on the meaning of a rule or a standard, like in the expression, the rule of faith of early Christians. That is, the rule of faith that determined correct belief and practice. That is, the, the way to live, how to live. From this meaning, canon came to mean for a list of scriptural books. Now, it's this meaning, a list of scriptural books, that has caused challenges to answering our present question. How closed does a list have to be before we have a canon? So, does it have to be like all the way closed to the point where no one's debating whether a book should be on that list or not? Like, how close does it have to be? Or, or can it be kind of more of a loose connection, or a, a loose list of books that, uh, that have maybe disputes or debates at the edges? If the list has to be terra firma, <laughs> then we don't have a closed canon for quite a long time. If the lists reflect a core canon with what we might describe as soft edges, then we can talk about a canon much earlier. But here's my quick and messy definition for tonight. A canon is an exclusive list of authoritative books. Okay, that's the most important part. An exclusive list of authoritative books that may or may not still reflect ongoing discussion of books at the soft edges of the hard core. The church recognized this canon across the early centuries of, his, of its existence. Now these slides should be available with the video, so hopefully you can review that um, and we can, we can talk about that more. This is just a simple table of contents. I think it's from the ESV study Bible of the Old Testament. So it's got uh, your traditional 39 books they're listed from Genesis to Malachi. No surprises. This, on the other hand, is a modern Roman Catholic Old Testament table of contents. Can everybody see the red arrows, though? So those are by six books, specifically, that weren't on the last table of contents. Those books are Tobias, or some might say Tobit, and uh, Judith, the Book of Wisdom, the Book of Ecclesiasticus. Sometimes this is also called the Book of Ben Sirah. And then the books of 1st and 2nd Maccabees there at the bottom. We're going to call those the big six tonight. Okay, I'm not going to say all those six titles all the time. We're just going to call them the big six. How's that? Let's go to the next slide. Now, that was our modern table of con. Those are all from the 20th century. But now, we're going to step back in history to find out where those lists came from. Let's start with 1647, the Westminster Confession of faith. I apologize if we don't like Westminster in here. I could have used the London Baptist Confession of 1689 if that were any better. I don't know. But in any case, this is the same list of 39 books that you find in that ESV table of contents. Okay? No surprises. It is simply, under this little preface, under the name of Holy Scripture or the Word of God written, are now contained all the books of the Old and New Testament. Which are these of the Old Testament? Genesis through Deuteronomy, Joshua through Esther, there's your history books, Job through Song of Songs, those are the wisdom books, and Isaiah through Malachi are the prophets. Does everybody see those four nice sections there? That was uh, chapter 1, or article 1, paragraph 2. This is now article 1, paragraph 3 of the same confession. The books commonly called Apocrypha not being of divine inspiration, are no part of the canon of the Scripture, and therefore are of no authority. Note that connection between canon and authority. 
in the church of God, nor to be any otherwise approved or made use of than other human writings. Now, this is my commentary. The Westminster divines do not even list the apocryphal books. And therefore, their list looks like the table of contents of our Bible today. Now, I'm going to ask the question, was it always so? This is actually uh, an exact image of the table of contents of the King James Version 1611. Now, I noticed I had a, uh, a new King James Version here. And, um, and when you look at the table of contents in here, it's pretty simple. It's got the Old Testament, 39 books, the New Testament, 27 books, right? Well, can you see my red box, though? That's actually, that's actually marking off the books called Apocrypha. Because in the original King James Version of 1611, not only did they print the Old and New Testaments, but in between they also published books that we call Apocrypha. That is the big six. There were a few other editions, but mainly the big six books. Judith, Tobit, Wisdom, Ecclesiasticus, and First and Second Maccabees. But look at that, right there on the table of contents. Moving a little further back from 1611, we arrive at 1563 and the Anglican 39 Articles. I think this is a bit clearer, it's a bit bigger. But uh, in addition to the Old Testament books up top, they also, notice my red box, they also printed these books. But notice the little preface beforehand. It says, and the other books, as Hiromi saith, that is, as Jerome saith, the church doth read, for example, of life and instruction of manners. But doth it not apply them to establish any doctrine? Such are these following. That is, these books give us great examples for how to live life under the fear of God. Do you follow? But, but you're not to go to those books to establish doctrines like justification by faith alone or something like that. Okay? We're not going to establish doctrine on these books, uh, Article 6 says. But we are going to look at books like Tobit and Judith just to kind of determine what an example of a godly life is. That's fascinating. Most of us probably were taught to stay away from these books, yet the, traditionally Protestantism held these books out as examples of how to live. All right. My favorite, Martin Luther. Last year, did you all celebrate the Reformation, 1517, 500th anniversary? Yeah. Well, most of us were relishing in our justification by faith. I know I was. Uh, but I was also intrigued by his 1534 German translation and the table of contents here. The top says the Bucher des Alten Testaments 24. That is the book of the, the 24 books of the Old Testament. And he actually lists them out. 24 books, you ask. Why not 39? What's going on here? This is tricky. Well... You see, he'll actually count 1st and 2nd Samuel as one book. And you'll find, we'll see in a moment, there's ancient precedent for that. It wasn't always 1st and 2nd Samuel. Sometimes it was just the one book of Samuel. Very practical reason for that. In Hebrew, there are no vowels. You can fit the entire book of 1st and 2nd Samuel on one scroll. As soon as you translate 1st and 2nd Samuel into Greek, you add vowels and the text becomes all that much longer and you have to split that book between two scrolls. Hence, 1st Samuel and 2nd Samuel. But in the Hebrew tradition, that is one book. So Luther actually knows this and counts the book of Samuel as one. He also counts the book of Kings as one, you see. And uh, on down, you'll see the last book there, number 24, that's the book of the 12 prophets, all the minor prophets, from Hosea to Malachi, 12 books are counted as one book on the Jewish numbering system. How about that? And isn't it fascinating to know, brothers and sisters, that, that sort of the forefather of Protestantism in 1534 actually had access to that tradition? And we're going to see just how far back that goes in just a moment. What I also want you to see from these table of contents is my second bracket down here, Judith. Starts with Judith. Basically, those are the apocryphal books. 
When you actually get to the section of the apocryphal books in the Luther Bible, 1534, you find this preface here that is apocrypha. That is, books not considered equal to Holy Scripture, but which are still useful and good to read. So here's Martin Luther. He's supposed to hate Roman Catholics and all Roman Catholic tradition, isn't he? But brothers and sisters, by 1534, we're well into the Reformation at this point, and his Bible is still publishing the apocryphal books. And he's not saying, don't read these. He's actually saying that though they're not considered equal to the Holy Scriptures, remember the 39 articles said the same thing, don't establish doctrine or points of faith on these books, but nevertheless, they're good and useful to read because they illustrate piety, they're exemplary of piety. Here's a different response. This is the Council of Trent from 1546. I, I won't read through all these books, but you'll notice that in the third bullet point, there are four bolded titles. Tobias, Judith, Wisdom, and Ecclesiasticus. And then at the very bottom, we have bolded first and second Maccabees. Notice how these books are integrated with all of the other canonical books, just like in the modern table of contents of the Roman Catholic Bible. Did everybody see that? Remember that earlier, those six arrows? Well, that modern Roman Catholic Bible is taking its marching orders, so to speak, from the Council of Trent in 1546. All those six books, the big six, integrated with the other canonical books. How did we arrive at the impasse, then, of the Reformation? How did you get Luther's Bible in 1534 with apocryphal books pulled out not on the same level as Scripture, but nevertheless good and useful to read. And then the Council of Trent with those big six books all integrated with the rest of the canonical books. In other words, treated as equally authoritative. That's the difference. How'd we get there? Well, there are important steps right up to the Reformation, which we can't go through. But uh, it, the, the, this uh, work behind me is known as the Complutensian Polyglot. It was done, edited, by a cardinal of the Roman Catholic Church, Cardinal Himenes. It's fascinating to know that he and Martin Luther would have agreed on the contents of the Old Testament. But Cardinal Himenes <laughs> is, uh, is, sta stays with the Catholic Church. Okay. Uh, but yet they would have agreed on the contents of the Bible. There were important intermediate steps throughout the Middle Ages that can't detain us tonight. So we're going to go right to the patristic period. Now, we're going to go right to the biblical canon lists themselves. There are different types of evidence from the patristic period, roughly 100 to like 550, let's say, for the patristic period. We could look at manuscripts tonight. We don't have time to do that. We could look at how different church fathers and Jews cite or, or quote from different books or what's called usage. We could analyze that. But we're going to stick with the canon list tonight because the canon lists provide the most specific evidence of the biblical canon from the second through the fifth centuries. And if we're paying attention, really close attention here, we're going to see that these early lists anticipate the 16th century debates that we just kind of described very quickly those debates between Protestants and Catholics. But that debate is anticipated centuries beforehand. And we're going to look at that right now. So in a summary, we'll unpack some of this. What we can see is that there's actually quite a bit of evidence for the Protestant or Jewish canon here on the left if we were to take the time to analyze all of these Greek canon lists. I'll give you a few examples in a moment, but we won't go through all of them. But there are also, what I want you to see, and we will look at specific examples in a moment, there are examples of canon lists that support the Catholic canon. That, that is the inclusion of the big six. Okay? So, so we're going to work through this a bit slowly here. But our first stop is Bishop of Alexandria, Athanasius. Do we know who Athanasius is? He's not really that famous for his work on the canon, though he kind of is if you're really geeking out. But he's more famous for his defense of the deity of Christ and the eternal 
Son of God, eternally generated, okay? That's, that's what he's most famous for, for laying it all on the line there. But he's also very important when we're talking about where we get our Bible from. So, what we'll see here is that Athanasius has a canon list of 22 books. And he even says explicitly these are 22 books after the letters, the number of letters in the Hebrew alphabet. That is 22. Now, notice how he kind of carves it up a little bit. Most of these titles we recognize. He calls first and second kingdoms, uh, or what we would call first and second Samuel, he calls first and second kingdoms. What we call first and second kings, he would have called third and fourth kingdoms. These are small changes now. Notice, though, uh, when you get down to the bottom of that middle column, Jeremiah, he includes the books Baruch, Lamentations, and the Epistle of Jeremiah with the book of Jeremiah. That's obviously different than the Protestant canon, okay? But he, there was a, an early view that Jeremiah actually wrote all those books. We believe that Jeremiah wrote Lamentations, for example, but some early Christians also thought that Jeremiah wrote the book of Baruch. This is a little bit hard to sustain now, but for reasons we can't go into now. Uh, notice with Daniel, he probably would have included that book, Susanna, okay? Which is in the Roman Catholic Bible, but not in ours. We'll come back to that in a minute. What I really want you to see from Athanasius, though, is now in a totally separate category, so not the canonical books, but in this category of books to be read, look what he puts in there. Wisdom, Sirach, that's our book Ecclesiasticus, Esther, Judith, and Tobit. So when it comes to the big six, would Athanasius include them in the canon or outside of the canon? Outside of the canon. Brothers and sisters, this was shocking to me when I first looked at this list. I thought I was going to find the Roman Catholic canon list everywhere in these early church fathers. Because if you listen to Roman Catholics long enough, they just say, well, there's this straight line back to, to Jesus and Paul. What, what we have today is, can be def, you know, defended all the way back. And I thought, man, if that's true, then I should see that in Athanasius, the great Athanasius. And yet Athanasius' is canon does not equal the canon of the Council of Trent. Does everybody see that? Okay. In fact, those big six books are important. They're books to be read to new converts, he goes on to say, but he explicitly says they are not canonical. Okay? So everybody sees that. Different, different levels, different tiers of books here. Let's go to the next one. With Jerome, we really come to the source of our Protestant canon. Notice his canon list. Again, he includes the 12 prophets as one book. Jeremiah includes Lamentations. He, Jer Jerome is very clear that the books of Baruch and Epistle of Jeremiah are not a part of Jeremiah. Uh, notice he counts Judges and Ruth together as one book. A lot of early Jews did that, and so he follows suit. But notice in the far column... Jerome stops talking about canonical books, and he switches to what he calls apocryphal books. And there he puts wisdom, Sirach, Judith, Tobit, the shepherd of Hermas, <laughs> and first and second Maccabees. So where does Jerome, Saint Jerome, where does he put the six books, the big six? In the canon or outside? Outside. Exactly. This is fascinating, right? This is a, this is a Catholic saint. Let's go to the next list. Aha. The great Augustine, about four years later, 397, in a work called On Christian Teaching, he provides a canon list. Now, notice something here. Where are the bold titles? And are there categories or not? No. They're all integrated in, aren't they? In fact, it looks just like or very similar to the list from Trent. And it looks very similar to the list of the modern Roman Catholic Bible table of contents, doesn't it? You see, back in the late 4th century, you had Jerome arguing for what we might call a narrower canon, and you had Augustine arguing for what might be called the wider canon, you see. Both Bibles, the Protestant Bible and the Roman Catholic Bible, go back to Jerome and Augustine. Okay, everybody see that? This is huge. It took me decades to get to where you are all at right now. Okay? Seriously. Seriously.
So, we're going to ask the big question, who's right? And I'm going to say right up front, this is a difficult question to answer. But a possible way forward is to ask, which of these lists, Jerome, Augustine, which of these lists reflects the earliest church tradition? In other words, can we determine whether it was Augustine or Jerome who deviated from the tradition and made the novel move, either not to include the deuterocanonical or apocryphal books, or to include them? Right? So, so someone did something, right? The question is, who, who invented something new and who stayed conservative, right? That's what I'm asking. Was it novel in the 4th century to stick close to the Jewish canon like we saw in Athanasius and Jerome? Or was the novelty to put more weight on what churches were reading in their liturgies like Augustine did? This is a difficult question to answer. <coughs> but if we could verify the contents of later lists, that is these 4th century lists, by checking earlier ones, we might be able to reach an answer. Well, such a list or two presents themselves. Our first list is Melito of Sardis. Notice the date on this now, 170 AD, right? That's significantly before the 390s. Okay. And he gives a list of books. And uh, it's fascinating here. I've put out in bold just a couple of notes here. There's no mention of the big six or the book of Esther here. So that's a bit of a problem for us too, right? Esther's not there. So let's just be honest about that. But neither are the books of Tobit, Judith, 1st, 2nd Maccabees, Wisdom, and Sirach. So therefore, we have close conformity to the Jewish canon. As a result, 170 AD, Melito of Sardis is a Christian and he went back east to determine what the eastern churches were considering part of the canon. And this is the list he comes back with, and it doesn't include any of the apocryphal books. I think this is fascinating. Y'all are way ahead of me at this point. Let's go to the next slide. Here's another list, slightly earlier than Melito. Scholars are dating it now to 100 to 150 AD. I'm just gonna cut right to the chase in the bottom right corner. No mention of the big six here. No, and which therefore leads to a close conformity to the Jewish canon as a result. Okay, next slide. So, several lists from the third and fourth centuries. We didn't have time to survey them all. It just You have to look in the canon list book to see them all. Origen, Cyril of Jerusalem, Athanasius, the Synod of Laodicea, Gregory of Nazianzus, Epiphanius, a whole lot of names of people we don't recognize, and yet a whole lot of names of people that give us significant information on the contents of the, of the ancient Bible. All of these folks mention or imply the church's canon of scriptural books in connection with the Jewish canon of 22 books, after the pattern of the 22 letters of the Hebrew alphabet. These same lists, along with others, exclude the big six apocryphal or deuterocanonical books. Now, other lists have more than these 22 books, such as we saw in Augustine. But we can verify that the lists that do not include the deuterocanonical books reflect the earliest tradition as demonstrated from the second century list. So when we look at the fourth century list, to determine who did something new, we can go back a couple hundred years and say, oh, it was Augustine that did something new. Right? Yeah. I, for whatever reason, well, there's a reason, he adds these books, okay, to his canon list, whereas Jerome and Hilary and other 4th century Greek fathers do not include these books. There was a tension between the church's adoption of the Jewish canon and the other books they were reading that eventually became part of the canon of some churches, and significantly, Rome is among these churches that adopts the wider canon list. So, so I think that's what explains the Roman Catholic canon with Augustine, with something else called the Council or the Synod of Hippo, and with Pope Innocent I of Rome, 
we actually can see three specific canon lists that all had the wider canon, okay? And that's what leads, brothers and sisters, to the big discussions in the 1500s. And today, if you meet a Roman Catholic uh, who knows something, they will say, you don't have the Bible. They'll tell you that. You don't have the Bible. And I would say, <laughs> you need to say back to them and say, well, you have the Bible of Augustine. We have the Bible that goes back later and earlier than, or earlier than Augustine. You see that? That's the response. Then it's like, oh, you actually know. Like, you have some evidence here. Yeah, we have a lot of evidence that your canon looks new. Even in 397, looks new, you see. Yeah. Whence did the narrower list of books come? So now we're going to go back. How far back can we press this Protestant canon? Do you see what I'm trying to do here? How far back can we go? So around 95 AD, Josephus, in a work called Against Apian, mentions that the Jews have only 22 books. Now, that sounds similar, right? Because all these later Christian lists are appealing to 22 books. It looks like they're getting this from Josephus and other Jewish uh, authors who had the same idea. Only 22 books. He, he, he distinguishes the five from Moses, the 13 of prophets, and four remaining books, 22 books. He then says these books are the ones written from Moses, the lawgiver, to Artaxerxes, which is kind of the period of Esther. Okay? So, so during this period of time, only 22 books that we have, and, and these are afforded absolute trust. He then says in, in the second bullet point here that Jews have other books written after Artaxerxes, after this time, but they are not afforded the same trust as those written beforehand. Yet I think, and trying to read into that a little bit, Josephus sees value, usefulness, uh, in some of these books, even though they're not afforded the same trust. Kind of like we saw in those late, earlier Protestant statements, right? There, there are these canonical books, which we, which we afford all trust, <laughs> and then there are those other books which we don't establish doctrine on, but they're useful. They, they illustrate what it means to fear God, right? That kind of thing. Well, the Jews had a similar view. The period before Josephus is riddled with questions. We're going to speculate a little bit together. But Josephus is our first clearest statement on the canon, brothers and sisters. 95 AD, we have a statement of only 22 books, five from Moses, 13 from prophets, and four remaining books which we know are pretty much the Psalms and the three Solomonic books, okay? Um, basically, those, those contents mirror our own Bibles, actually, okay? But whence did Josephus get the list? Going back a little bit further. Well, we're now at the Dead Sea. Do you, did you recognize it? Notice the southern half is uh, really drying up according to Google Maps here. It's really drying up, yeah. And uh, so, so what we have here, you can see Jerusalem there off to the left and Jericho just to the north. And then right below Jericho, on the northwest corner of the Dead Sea, we have Qumran. Famous site, 11, maybe 12 now, right? 12 caves, maybe a 13th. That's what it is. 12 caves, maybe a 13th cave. Uh, they're still exploring, still doing archaeology of the caves. But anyways, 212 some biblical manuscripts were discovered. Fragments, I should be clear, fragments of manuscripts discovered at Qumran. These manuscripts date from 250 B.C. to 70 A.D. For the first time, we had evidence of the Hebrew Bible from before the time of Jesus. Astounding discoveries, 1947. Astounding discoveries. Well, at Qumran, all of the books that eventually made it into the Jewish canon were found, except Esther. Interestingly, Esther was not found. There were also other books found in a large number of manuscripts, such as the Book of Jubilees, books known as Enochic literature and the community rule. In fact, some of these were found in such staggering numbers. Some scholars have gone so far as to say, well, the, the, the Qumran community just thought that these books were canonical or scripture. And maybe they did. We, we really don't know. Because see my first bullet point. They didn't leave a canon list. <laughs> it 
We don't know, really, what they thought of these books. We do know that quantity of manuscripts may only equal popularity, and it may not actually equal sanctity. Do you see the difference there? Okay. Um, so some other points of evidence to, to, to kind of go against my, my uh, point about Jubilees and, and um, Enochic literature. The Essenes, they're probably the ones who lived at Qumran. The Essenes seem only to cite from books that would later comprise the Jewish canon. That is, we have no examples, no clear examples, of Qumran uh, inhabitants citing in their books uh, books like Jubilees or books like The Rule of the Community. No citations. But when they do cite books, they cite books from what is now our Bible. Okay? They cite books from the Jewish canon, or, or that would become later the Jewish canon. Furthermore, like if you really want to know what a community thinks of a book, what books are they writing commentaries on? Isn't this interesting? Notice how like we, even we don't write books on, or commentaries on every book. We write commentaries on those books that are canonical, right? Or, or, or very, very significant, spiritually speaking. We'll write commentaries on those. Well, the Qumran community also had a commentary tradition, but we only have evidence of commentaries on books that later became part of the Jewish canon. We don't have evidence of commentaries on Jubilees or the rule of the community. Do you follow? So don't be fooled when someone says, but there were 15 manuscripts of Jubilees and only a smattering of Obadiah. See, they really thought Jubilees was canonical. Obadiah, well, kind of hogwash, right? Because the 12 prophets, several of those minor prophets, have commentaries on them from Qumran. Jubilees, no commentaries. It's not about quantity of manuscripts that you find in the desert. It's just not. Uh, sort of a sidebar here. There are more early copies of the Gospel of Thomas than the Gospel of Mark. Three to one, actually. Okay? And, um, and yet, <laughs> don't, don't, it may only mean that the Gospel of Thomas was popular. It doesn't mean it was sacred like Mark. Do you follow that? How do I know that? Well, you go to early Christian statements where everybody says the Gospel of Thomas is dangerous, but the Gospel of Mark is part of the traditional ancient fourfold gospel. More on that in a minute. How else could we determine this? Let's go to the next slide. Here's another Jew, Philo of Alexandria, 20 BC to 40 AD. Philo does not leave us a canon list. He doesn't leave us a bunch of manuscripts either, but he does leave us a body of literature in which he cites from biblical books a lot. In fact, some thousands of times he cites from the Pentateuch, right? Genesis to Deuteronomy. Thousands of times Philo cites the Pentateuch. Much fewer times he cites from other books later to be reckoned as part of the Jewish canon, such as the book of Proverbs, for example. But here's the key point from Philo. He never once cites material from books later called deuterocanonical or apocryphal. So, brothers and sisters, if the canon was so fluid and so up in the air, why is it that a prolific Jewish writer from Alexandria like Philo never once cites the book of Wisdom of Solomon? Because I don't think it was so fluid. I don't think it was a canon hardened, right, like we talked about earlier, but there was a core canon already by the time of Philo, you see. We don't have a list, so it's really hard to prove that with certainty, but I'm just trying to connect a few dots here. Do you follow? Okay, let's go to the next slide. How about the New Testament authors? Well, once again, I mean, I really wish Paul would say, um, here's my canon list. <laughs> right? But we don't get Paul the Apostle's canon list. But, but what do we do get? Well, we get copious citations of Old Testament books in the New Testament. We get manifold. And they never once cite from the big six. Never once. There might be some allusions, 
There might be some, you know, some literary echoes or something like this, but never once a citation, a just as it has been written kind of quotation. Never happens. We do get a quotation of First Enoch in the book of Jude. Now that's strange, and I don't have time to go into all of that tonight, but here's one thing I would say. No community, Jewish or Christian, has ever seriously suggested that one Enoch should be in the canon. Tertullian, one exception out here, okay, in terms of Christians advocating for one Enoch to be in the canon, okay? But other than that, one Enoch is never once in a canon list, ever, okay? And uh, again, you may get some allusions to Enoch in Jesus' Olivet Discourse and things like that, but not once is it a just as it has been written. And then a quotation from Enoch. That doesn't happen. So let's go to the conclusions, and I'm going to rest my own on two prominent scholars in the field. The first is from Dead Sea Scrolls scholar James Vanderkam. He says, there was a limited set of books that was a functional collection of authoritative texts on which all or most Jews could agree. That's a staggering statement. If the canon was super fluid, if it was like totally chance, you couldn't make a statement like that. But what Vanderkam has done is he's taken the evidence of the citations that we kind of just breezed by. He took the evidence of the manuscripts. He took the evidence of the commentaries from Qumran. And he realized that they all sort of concentrated on a limited set of books. Surprise, surprise, the books that would later be included in the Jewish canon and later be included in the early Christian canon. Philip Alexander, who is a rabbinics scholar, concludes this in a similar essay. He says, what the rabbis were doing, that is around 100 AD, what the rabbis were doing was defending a canon <laughs> which they had received already more or less defined, save for a little fuzziness around the edges from the pre-70 period. So, so we're talking about a Jewish canon established long before AD 70 with a little fuzziness around the edges. So my third point here is thus it's very difficult to have assured answers from the period before our canon lists. It just is, if we're honest. But generally, the Jewish canon was more or less settled before 70 AD, even if there was fuzziness around the edges with a book like Ecclesiastes. I don't have time to go through the, the disputes over Ecclesiastes and Song of Songs that the Jews were having, but they were having some disputes. But that doesn't mean there wasn't a canon, you see. There's a core canon, a hardcore canon, with some soft, dis edges, soft edges with some disputes. Early Christianity's canon reflects this situation. Both the canon, that is the hardcore uh, canon, and the fuzziness around the edges. There are some canon lists. We read the one by Athanasius where Esther is not included. Remember that? It was in the second tier, not the, not the first. So there were, there were some holdover disputes even amongst early Christians. Let's go to the conclusion to Old Testament canon. Both the Protestants and Catholic Old Testaments can claim historical precedent in the Christian tradition. You must acknowledge this in your debates, <laughs> if you have them. You must say, yes, that's true. Trent's list can go back to Augustine's list. You must say that. That's, that's fine. We acknowledge that. Uh, don't say there's no precedent, because there is precedent for the Roman Catholic Bible. But only the Protestant Bible can claim to go back to the Jewish canon of 22 books. That is, numbering Ruth with Judges and Lamentations with Jeremiah. This tradition appears to be the older of the two, certainly evidenced by Josephus, and probably was the canon of many Jewish groups earlier than the first century. Therefore, and here's kind of the critical conclusion, the Latin West, with Augustine, probably revised the traditional Old Testament by adding books that were no doubt important to Jews and Christians everywhere. That is, Jews and Christians were reading the big six. They were reading those books, Wisdom and Sirach. They loved those books, but they always kept the distinctions between the canonical books and the books that were useful. You see that? Big difference there. 
And so Augustine, however, kind of crossed a line, I would say, because, and he didn't do it by himself, obviously. Many, many churches in North Africa were already doing this. And so Augustine basically includes the books that the churches in North Africa had already been using as canon. Okay. <clears throat> All right, we're going to go quickly now. The New Testament canon. The Council of Trent, 1546. We don't have to debate this. They're actually on the right side of the debate. 27 books, they match your New Testament exactly. We're also looking once again at the Luther Bible, 1534. And it's hard to see those, with those small Roman numerals, but there's only 23 books listed. Remember, our New Testament has 27. He actually puts down there at the bottom, without numbers, all the way to the right there, the Epistle to the Hebrews, the Epistle of James, the Epistle of Jude, and the Revelation, or the Apocalypse of John. Well, that's interesting. I've actually never seen an ancient canon list that looks like that. And yet, those books all were disputed in the early period. And I think Luther is acknowledging that. When did the 27-book New Testament come to be? Well, we start with Athanasius again in 367. First time, all 27 books listed. But note, he did not invent the canon. I think the books were already considered or, or recognized as canonical long before 367, but that's the first data point. Around 250, we can go back now, over 100 years, the, the Church Father Origen lists all 27 books. Some debate over whether Revelation is in the list, but many manuscripts have Revelation. But even if you don't have Revelation, you have Origen with a 26 book, New Testament, canon list, by 250. That's significant. But we can go back further than that when we're talking about the New Testament. This is the beautiful book of Kells here. Around 800 AD, what you have are, are the symbolic depictions of the four Gospels. So from the top left in clockwise, you have Matthew as a man, Luke as a calf or an ox, uh, sorry, Mark as a lion, John as an eagle, and Luke as a calf or an ox. The symbols would change, but this scheme of representing the Gospels or the Gospel writers according to these animals or, or living beings uh, goes back a long way to at least as far as Irenaeus, around 180 A.D. When were the Gospels first associated? Brothers and sisters, probably before 180 A.D., but let's just start with what we know. Here's Irenaeus. He says, It's not possible that there be more Gospels in number than these, or fewer. By way of illustration, since there are four zones in the world in which we live, and four cardinal winds, and since the church is spread over the whole earth, and since the pillar and bulwark of the church is the Gospel and the Spirit of life, consequently she has four pillars, blowing imperishability from all sides and giving life to men. He is saying that because of things as so elemental as the four winds and the four corners and, and all this, in, in the created order there could only be four Gospels and no more and no less. Whether we buy that explanation or not is not really the point. <laughs> the point is this. He, he can talk about the fourfold gospel in such certain terms by 180, probably because that fourfold gospel was established long before. Do you, does that make sense? Okay. The gospel of Thomas in this scheme has no chance. Let's just put it that way. Okay? Has no chance. We've got to keep moving. Moving now. So four gospels by 180. How would we establish the Pauline epistles from the second century? Well... We could go to that same church father, Tertullian, who wrote a five-chaptered work, five-book work, I guess, against Marcion, a, a church heretic from around 150 A.D. Tertullian says this in book five of Against Marcion. He says, to this epistle, that is Philemon in this context, alone did its brevity avail to protect it against the falsifying hands of Marcion. It's hard for me to describe what he's doing here, but in in book five, 
Tertullian is going point by point through Marcion's mutilation of the Pauline epistles. Marcion's Pauline text did not at all match the, the, the orthodox uh, Pauline text of the epistles, okay? And so, so what he was doing in this book against Marcion is saying, look, Marcion says this, but all the best manuscripts are this. But for our purposes, he, Tertullian goes through 13 epistles of Paul. He leaves out Hebrews. He doesn't think Hebrews was written by Paul, but, but 13 epistles of Paul. And he says at the very end, he says his aim, that is Marcion's aim, was, I suppose, to carry out his interpolating process even to the number of St. Paul's epistles. So Tertullian, by 200, is already working with a set number of Pauline epistles that Marcion mutilated or interpolated. Do you see that? That's fascinating. So we can use that as a data point to show that Paul's epistles by this time were already collected and considered to be a unity. Let's go to the next one. Quick summary. By around 200 AD, there was a four gospel collection, 13 or 14 epistles of Paul. Again, depending on whether Hebrews was included or not. I, I did cut out... Clement of Alexandria cites from all 14 epistles of Paul except for Philemon, and he dies around 215 A.D., you see. So, so clearly, you've got church fathers making use of and citing all 14 epistles of Paul. We also know that the book of Acts did not present any problems, and early on, the book of Revelation was no problem. It's fascinating how many church fathers from the second century simply thought Revelation was scripture for the church, period. The Catholic or general epistles would be acknowledged about a half to a full century later, according to our evidence. Let's go to the next problem area here. In modern apologetics manuals, you'll read about the Muratorian Fragment. And it's almost always dated to the second century AD. Well, I just, this is maybe geeking out a bit too much here, but I just want to be clear you can't sort of play the Muratorian fragment card anymore because there's a lot of scholarship out there that tries to date it to the fourth century, which is late, right? If you're trying to establish an early canon. So, so just be careful. Don't, don't say, well, to, to the skeptic now at this point, again, your Roman Catholic friend agrees with you on the 27-book New Testament, right? No problem. But, but now the skeptic is saying, no, 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 no. I've heard about Nag Hammadi from Time Magazine. I know there are Gnostic Gospels that your forefathers hid, and they didn't want them in the Bible, right? Like they had a chance, like it actually worked out that way, right? But, but that's what's in Time Magazine, okay? That's what your friend is reading. That's what, that's, that's the belief out there on the street. Well, it used to be that you would say, ah, but I got the Muratorian fragment from the second century, and boom, no Gnostic Gospels in there at all. Let's actually see what that looks like. So the Muratorian fragment, one, its date is very unsure, it could be 2nd or 3rd century. I'm not saying that's impossible, but there are many scholars arguing for the 4th now, so just be aware. But look at what the Muratorian fragment lacks. Hebrews, James, 1st, 2nd Peter, and probably 3rd John. Uh, Matthew and Mark, we think, are included because by the time you pick up with the fragment, it's kind of a, it, it, it's, it's a bit damaged, the manuscript. Luke is called the 3rd Gospel, John the 4th. Therefore, Matthew and Mark are assumed, okay? But it is lacking Hebrews, James, 1st, 2nd Peter, and 3rd John. So it's not a full New Testament canon in any case, no matter how you splice it. Okay. Let's go to the next slide. Talking about the Catholic epistles, seven uh, general epistles, or, or, or oftentimes called Catholic epistles. Here's a Syriac canon list of the New Testament, and none of the Catholic epistles are listed in this manuscript with a tradition that goes back to 350 to 400 AD. None of them. In fact, what I've got boxed here is the total of the apostle, that is Paul. So all 14 epistles of Paul were listed up above, and then it gives you how many verses there were, and then it jumps right to the total of all the sacred books of the Holy Church. And uh, the Catholic epistles and Revelation are omitted. 
altogether. So they, these books were not accepted in the early Syriac church. To this day, only the major ones, James, 1 Peter, 1 John, are accepted. The four minor ones, right, 2 Peter, 2 3 John, Jude, uh, are still not accepted fully in the Syriac church. Now, this debate was already anticipated by a church historian named Eusebius around 325. By 325, Eusebius says, look, the churches are only agreed on 1 Peter and 1 John. The other five books we know about, but, but they're disputed, is what he says. They're disputed. Which, by the way, there's a little bit of a distinction between disputed and what he calls disputed spurious later on in the list. Disputed spurious are books that never made it into the canon. His disputed books all eventually made it into the canon, you see. So, so he says 1 Peter and 1 John are, are recognized or canonical. The others are disputed by churches in the East. In the West, though, the Catholic epistles were not disputed very much at all. The revelation of John. There's a long history here. I can't go through it all. It was accepted early and then disputed only to be finally accepted in the Greek East. That means, initially they thought John the Apostle wrote it. A bishop named Dionysius of Alexandria in the 3rd century disputed whether it was John the Apostle that wrote it or John the Elder, a different John. And um, Eusebius popularized this argument uh, in his church history, and it cast doubt on the book of Revelation in the early 4th century. All I can tell you is this, by the latter part of the 4th century, in our Greek lists, and even in the list of Athanasius himself, Revelation is included. Okay. This book, from what I can tell, was accepted in the Western Church from an early time. We even saw it in the Muratorian fragment, so if that's early, then it's already there. All right, we're keeping it moving. So, just some other problem areas. There was a tendency among some Christians to reduce the number of Gospels. You had a, a church father by the name of Tatian around 170, 180. He made a dia tesserone, that is a one Gospel through the four. Could you imagine this? It would be like a perfect harmony he's trying to make. But what's the problem with that? He's eliminated the fourfold Gospel, right? <laughs> yeah, he's, he's made the one Gospel through the four, which I got to, we don't have it today, by the way. It's not fully extant. There are fragments of it everywhere. Uh, good scholars working to try to reconstruct it, you know. But, but, but you don't have the fourfold gospel with the diatessaron. You have the one through the four. In other words, I think some Christians were a little uneasy with having four separate gospels. Because as you know, right, there are, there are some differences. Like, I want to know, what did Tatian do when he got to the resurrection scene, was it one angel or two? When he had to make a decision there, right? I don't know. I don't know what he did. <laughs> but, but we know that, that, that Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and John, uh, from an early, early time, were meant to stand there independently and then together as the fourfold gospel. But, but some Christians weren't happy with that. Tatian collapsed them. Marcion goes about it a different way. Marcion, from all accounts, just seems to be this pragmatist, this, this real get-it-done kind of guy. We're going with Luke. I'm going to scrap the other three altogether. And not only are we going to go with Luke, we're going to, we're going to edit Luke heavily. We're going to call that the gospel. Okay. So that's another way of going about it. By the way, Marcion, Tatian is uh, still within the realm of, of proto-orthodoxy. Marcion is a heretic, okay? And uh, you will, you, Marcion is also famous for chopping the Old Testament. Gone. I want you to, write all those canon lists we looked at earlier, right? To be a Christian is to still have a canon of the Old Testament, right? Marcion chopped the Old Testament out altogether. Some of us are practical Marcionites. Sometimes I am. I, I tend to ignore the Old Testament for, for Jesus, maybe, or something like this, or Paul. Okay, but to be a Christian is to accept 
all the full revelation of God in the canon of Scripture, Old and New Testaments, okay? So that, that's, that's a really important pillar of early Christianity and Orthodox Christianity. There was also a tendency for more Gospels, right? I just don't have time to go into it all. The existence and circulation of more Gospels other than the four, such as the Gospel of Thomas, or the Gospel of Philip, or Gospel of Mary, what have you now. Uh, lots of different Gospels. These would have fit the category of apocryphal. They were not canonical. They were not useful. They were apocryphal. What are they? The best modern example I can come up with is the book like The Shack. How many have read The Shack? I've read reviews of The Shack. I haven't read The Shack. I don't know if it's worth my time, right? It's apocryphal, right? <laughs> but, but all the reviews of this book and all the little videos and, and, and uh, uh, previews and so on of this book all indicate to me one thing. This is one person's experience with God, right? That's what this is. If you read, uh, is it the Gospel of Peter or Philip, one of the two, you have this, um, this, this cross coming out of the tomb and proclaiming the resurrection of Jesus, okay? Like, it is this phenomenal scene. Well, what's that person doing? I think what's going on in that gospel, that person is reflecting on the victory of Jesus, right, over, over death, over the grave, through the cross, right, which comes out of the tomb itself. Now, of course, that doesn't happen in any of our four gospels, because our four Gospels are constantly in line with the rule of faith. Constantly. They had determined the rule of faith in, in, in every case. But these other Gospels are kind of like someone's reflections, experience maybe, you might argue, with, with the, the preaching of Jesus. Does that make sense? So we have modern apocryphal works like the shack. But see, I'm actually doing a disservice to something like the Gospel of Philip because that's actually better than the shack. Okay, can I, can I put it that way? Um, but, but I want you just, just to be clear here. At no point are we going to go to those Gospels to establish points of doctrine. And we, we're not going to go to those Gospels to even establish orthodoxy or orthopraxy, how to live. The canonical Gospels tell us what to believe and how to live. They give us the accurate portrait of Jesus even if it is quad, right, quad, like, like quad portrait uh, in the four Gospels. These other Gospels did not circulate widely. They were not written in Palestine. They were not from the first century. I think many, many scholars have established this. <clears throat> but they are people's reminiscences, reflections um, on who Jesus was, Okay. Um, but there's really not much at all to be gained in, in terms of faith, like, like orthodox faith or proto-orthodox faith, or, or how to live from these, from these gospels, or yeah, from these uh, apocryphal gospels. It is interesting to note that none of our canon lists or early statements associate these writings with the four gospels, never. Also interesting is that in no Greek manuscript is an apocryphal gospel joined to a canonical gospel. Manuscripts can join all kinds of books together, uh, but they at no point, at least we don't have evidence of it, of any one of the four gospels being joined to say the gospel of Thomas. That, that never happens. So this, this is perhaps instructive. The, the canon lists don't do it. The manuscripts don't do it. Maybe we shouldn't do it either, you see. So I would never advocate for the gospel of Thomas to be put within our Bible. I would never advocate for that. As there's no Christian precedent for that. None. Another problem area. We're about to wrap it up here. So, we're looking at two manuscripts. This bottom one here and the bottom left from the 5th century. That's a title of Clement's letter to the Corinthians from Codex Alexandrinus from the 5th century. So after the book of Revelation, the books of 1st and 2nd Clement are included in this manuscript. Interesting. In this manuscript to the right, this is called Codex Sinaiticus. 
In the first box, we're looking at the Apocalypseis Iowanu, that is the revelation of John. And then in the top box, a new book begins, that's the epistle of Barnabas. I just, our Bibles end at Revelation, right? In fact, there's a curse, right? At the end of Revelation, don't add to these words. What are they doing? What are they doing? I mean, it's right there. It's like in the next column over, that, that curse. <laughs> well, I don't think they're, they're going to be cursed for adding Barnabas to this manuscript. Okay, I don't think that's what's happening. The way we need to think about this is going back to those canon lists. Remember, there were the canonical books, right? And then in the middle, there were useful books. Okay, books that... Uh, we don't establish doctrine on, but books that exhibit what it means to fear God, exhibit true religion. Well, early Christians thought that the Epistle of Barnabas, and especially this book called The Shepherd of Hermas, which, which follows after Barnabas in, in this manuscript, uh, did that very thing. Okay? They thought that this would be kind of like reading uh, maybe John Bunyan's Pilgrim's Progress. Okay? Some sort of edificatory work that would illustrate piety, illustrate God-fearing, okay? Uh, not, not establishing doctrine, but illustrating God-fearing. So, in the manuscript, between two covers, you can put both the canonical books, which Codex Sinaiticus has all 27 books of our traditional New Testament, and Barnabas and Hermas, you see. Because those latter two books are useful, I would argue, according to the canon list. I'm not making this up. Athanasius would say, yes, John, those two books are books to be read. He lists the Shepherd of Hermas specifically as a book to be read. Not canonical like these books. See that? So I can go to a 4th century Christian in the know and ask him to interpret this data for me. I can do that, and it says, yeah, those last two books are useful. These other 27 books are canonized, canonical. Does that make sense? So when someone comes to you, and this could happen, and they say, yeah, but Christians weren't careful about what they put in their manuscripts. They put all kinds of things in there. You say, yes, but they knew what they were doing because they had lists which made very, very clear as to which books were canonical and which books were useful. All right. The matter of criteria. Lee McDonald... His book's not affordable, but it is, <laughs> but it is available as an e-book in, in Southeastern's library if you want to check this. <laughs> but he's basically got the most current explanation of, um, of what we call the criteria for canonicity. And basically, there are these five things. Apostolicity, that is, was the book written by an apostle or a close associate, right? A book had to be able to pass that test to make it into the New Testament, period. Okay? Um, the second one is kind of similar. Antiquity. Did the book come from the early era or was it recent? We can illustrate this from the Muratorian fragment itself. So if you'll allow me to read from the Muratorian fragment, page 71, or page 181, line 71. Here's what we're going to pull from this. He says this. We receive only the apocalypses of John and Peter, though some of us are not willing that the latter be read in church. That is, the apocalypse of John can be read in church. The apocalypse of Peter is a useful work, but man, some of us are like, man, we just don't read that in church. <laughs> That's bizarre stuff, okay? So we don't do that. Then he says this, but Hermas wrote the shepherd very recently in our times in the city of Rome while well, Bishop Pius, his brother, was occupying the Episcopal chair of the church of the city of Rome. Do you see how he, he made a little temporal statement there, didn't he? He wrote the book very recently in our times, and then here's the conclusion he draws. And therefore, it ought indeed to be read, but it cannot be read publicly to the people in church, either among the prophets, whose number is complete, or among the apostles, for it is after their time. See that? So the Shepherd of Hermas is a very good book to read, is what he's saying, but we can't read it publicly in church because it was written in our times long after the time of the apostles. 
Do you see that? So, so there's a criterion there of both apostolicity and antiquity. The book must come from the early era. If it's deemed to be recent, written in our times, well, it's not going to make it into the canon, you see. Does that help? So, again, how do we piece together Christian views of these things? You must go back to the sources. You have to go back to the sources to piece that together. Now, is the book orthodox? Does the book align to the rule of faith? Does it align to, to, <clears throat> to the orthodox views of God, of Christ, His Son? Does it align with the future judgment of the quick and the dead? Right? Do, does it align with the resurrection of Jesus? Okay? If, it, if it doesn't on any one of those points, then the book is simply not, not eligible for entrance into the canon. Now, here's one we've encountered already. How about use or, or the ecclesiastical criterion? What books were the churches reading in their liturgies? We saw that with Augustine. He said, hey, we're already reading these books. We really ought to include them. Adaptability, the scriptures that were adaptable to the changing circumstances of the church's life are the ones that survive the canonization process. The books of Barnabas, Hermas, and others simply weren't adaptable beyond their second century context. I can't go into inspiration tonight. Many will say that inspiration has to be considered a criterion for canonicity. The way I describe that is there were a lot of works considered to be divinely inspired in the, in the early centuries of the church. Even the book of Sherpet of Hermas, some Christians thought was divinely inspired, and yet it never made it into the canon. The way, I say, the way we describe this is inspiration is a, or sorry, is a necessary condition for canonicity, but it is not a sufficient condition for canonicity. Um, a book to make it into the canon had to meet Yes, the inspiration criterion, but lots of books did. But then further, it had to meet the other five criteria. They all had to kind of work together. Many of you will be happy to see the last slide. All right. You guys have been very good. <laughs> Final conclusions, wrapping it up. Probably some Jewish groups held to what became the rabbinic Bible before the first century AD. Not all Jews, probably, but... But, but definitely some Jewish groups did. Josephus holds that Jews held to his 22 books from long ago. Philo's and the New Testament citations from only these 22 books, but not all of them, support this view. Perhaps Qumran's wider scriptural repertoire equals a wider canon, some will say. But in the absence of a canon list from Qumran, it is very difficult to prove one way or the other. There was a Christian Old Testament by the middle of the second century, as the Bryennios list and the Melito list show. Probably, second point, probably there was a New Testament canon by the end of the second century. But there is contrary evidence given the disputes over the Catholic epistles, or the general epistles, and Revelation. Ultimately, I hope I haven't problematized this too much at least beyond what needed to be done. But ultimately, we place our faith and trust in Jesus, right? Who was raised from the dead. The providence of God oversaw the formation of the canon of Scripture. And I do believe we have it today, okay? It's not somewhere up in the ethereal realm of the forms. I, I think we have it today. And the providence of God ensures that we have, all we, that we have what we need, you see, for right belief and right practice. This last point, bordering on the sermonic, but here we go. Canon means rule. Remember that? So as academic as this discussion was tonight, and I think as crucial as a discussion uh, that it is and needs to happen, canon means rule. Thus, if we claim that the Bible is our canon, we should live accordingly, you see. Yeah, we need to believe every word from the mouth of God. 
And we need to obey His Word as best we can by His grace, by, energized by His Spirit. You follow? So let's, let's, let's take that away tonight, if anything else. I think the 66 books of our Protestant canon have a very, very ancient pedigree. Very, very ancient. Going way back, probably to the first century A.D., even beyond. Okay? But most importantly, rather than just sort of holding it up as we got the right canon, let's make sure we're living by that canon, that rule for our life and rule for our belief. Shall I close this in prayer? Yeah, oh, you will. Yes, great. Are there any quick questions oh, that yeah. you may have? Yeah, definitely. What you got tonight it's not, it felt like a fire hydrant. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure. Uh, I, I knew exactly where um, John was at. But I, I can guarantee you this. What you heard tonight, everything relevant on the subject of Old and New Testament was said. Now, you, you, it'll take you a few years to unpack it. Yes, that's right. But that's, yeah. that's called studying on your own. But everything relevant <laughs> on the canon from the old, I'm amazed how, how well you did, <laughs> was done tonight. Thank you, John. Appreciate All right. That. Hey, you're welcome. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> and again, um, I, I really encourage you, if you want to have a book like this, uh, from what I remember, I think I paid like $31 for this off of Amazon. It's a great book to have, and especially the first, I would say, um, 56 pages. It, it'll take you some time to read through, okay? Uh, but if you go through those 56 pages, you will you really understand the heart of the debate or what's going on with Old Testament canon and New Testament canon and what's really happening right now in the field of canonical studies. And so... And after the 56 pages, you have the various lists given to you. And I would love to have this. And I have it in my, of course, I would encourage you to have it on your bookshelves. That way, you know, you, time to time, you can look at it. And, and John is right. Uh, how many times I've had uh, parents call me and say, would you please talk to my son or my daughter? He, he just came back from college or she just came back from the university and and she doesn't want to go to church anymore because she doesn't believe. And, and then my question is, what does she not believe? Well, her professor told her that the Bible is just made up by the church. And it's just, you know, the church had a conspiracy and putting all this together. And so, you know, it's just a brainwash is all it is. And that's what she's saying now. And, and this is very real. And that's why we're doing this series. And I'm so glad... Uh, thank you, uh, John, for coming and talking about this because I, I hope, and I know it was a lot, and I know it was really intense, but I hope you'll take it in and, and think about it, ask questions, and, and uh, I'll be glad to help. And if I don't know, I'll call up John in, in Phoenix, Arizona, and he'll, he'll, he'll answer for me. All right, let's close with a word of prayer, and he'll be here up in the front for a few minutes. So if you want to come by, talk to him, feel free to do that, okay? Father, we thank you so much for this time, and thank you, Lord, not just for your word, and thank you for uh, your Son, the Word of Life, Jesus Christ, but, but even more, O oh God, thank you for uh, the, the people who have, through the ages, recognized your truth, and they have passed it down, and, and it takes work, it takes um, scholarship uh, like John. Uh, and others who come and who explain this and who help us understand that what we believe is not a myth or a fable or some agenda of some group or some people, but this is coming from you. And so help us, Lord, to stand firm in our faith, but even more so, as uh, John mentioned towards the end, help us to uh, believe it and then live by it and share the gospel of Christ uh, to every person we know, knowing that without him, uh, we're lost. We thank you again for tonight. Be with us as we go from this place. In Jesus' name.